I am Dr. Swanee Jet, and I have a passion for public health for over 30 years. Now, I'm in a position to affect change. And these are the critical conversations about health and our community with the people who can help me make those changes. Good afternoon. Welcome to CEO Live Talks with Dr. Jet. Today's guest is Dr. Ted Smith. Welcome to the set. Thank you so much. So, Dr. Smith, I know you're a professor at University of Louisville, but, you know, give me your elaborate title before we go anywhere else. <laughs> well, that'll take up the whole show, but we'll, we'll give it a shot. So, uh, so, I am a professor of environmental medicine, and so that means I'm in the School of Medicine, we're in the Department of Internal Medicine, and so really focused on the role the environment plays in health. In addition to that, I direct a center that we have. It's called the Center for Healthy Air, Water, and Soil, just like the name sounds. We care about air, water, and soil. And uh, we're part of a large organization called the Envirome Institute, where we have a lot of different researchers who are looking at different aspects of the environment from a basic science all the way up to an epidemiological frame. Now, I'm, I'm, I'm not a geek. Well, but somehow I think I probably should be a professor at the Environment Institute. <laughs> well, I think there's a reason that we know each other. I think it's because of all the great work that you do in our community. So, so everybody knows my story. Usually how I start off the shows is, you know, kind of like dive into somebody's background. And how did they become who they are? Um, because, you know, we don't just land, right? Right. So you had to have an upbringing or something to kind of lead you on this path. So where did you grow up at? So I grew up in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. And so just, just up the river here. Mm -hmm. uh, and, um, you know, in a solidly middle class uh, family, mm -hmm. uh, you know, a teacher for a mom and dad sold insurance. And uh, I, I sort of fell in love with science at a really early age. And being in Pittsburgh was special for me because... We had the University of Pittsburgh, we had Carnegie Mellon University. They were prominent features in, in, in my childhood in the city. And so, you know, really sort of pursued a career in science, you know, from a very early curious age. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, ultimately you went off to college, went off to graduate school and uh, in graduate school, you know, found a niche that I really was excited about, which happened to be working with astronauts. And so, uh, there were just a handful of people in the country that were focused on balance disorders mm -hmm. that um, are kind of special to the weightless environment. And so um, I didn't know it at the time, but you would call that environmental medicine. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, a change in the environment that changed the function of your physiology and your psychology. And so really exciting. Um, maybe, uh, maybe not so exciting is the, the, the way you, you work in that field is work on the problems that they have. And so I spent a lot of time being an expert at why astronauts throw up for the first three days. They're weightless. And, uh, you know, there's not a lot of people that want to do that job. No. Uh, <laughs> but it does give you an appreciation for how much we depend on gravity, you right. know, for actually just being well. So uh, that was really the early days for me. So um, growing up in Pittsburgh, because I know Pittsburgh had a lot of, um, it's a culture, it's more of a blue collar culture at one point. Yeah. Um, specifically because I know Pittsburgh Steelers, so specifically, you know, during the time we grew up, you know, you had Terry Bradshaw and Joe Gillum and those guys. Um, but there was a lot of air pollution issues. Yeah. There was a lot of environmental issues yeah. at the time. So in, in, in many ways, Pittsburgh and Louisville have a, a kind of a similar mm -hmm. air pollution past. Uh, both of these cities, uh, there was a period in time when you had to turn your headlights on in the middle of the day to mm -hmm. drive around. Mm -hmm. um, you know, when I was growing up, uh, the University of Pittsburgh had this giant uh, cathedral-like building. It's called the Cathedral of Learning. Insiders would call it the Tower of Ignorance. Whatever. It was black. <laughs> it was enti an entirely black building. And when I was growing up, I didn't think twice about it. But, you know, wow. I'd ask my mom at one point, like, well, why is that building black? Well, it's like, that's what? just the air pollution that's attached itself to the building. They've sandblasted it since then, but yeah. um, it just gives you a sense of, yeah, I mean, air pollution has been a major part of the mm -hmm. Western Pennsylvania story and, uh, and certainly part of our story here in Louisville. So lately, um, I've noticed probably the last five years, something similar to what Louisville is dealing with, um, homelessness. Mm. 
and it has grown three to four times in that area, in Allegheny County. Yeah, I, um, it's one of the hardest problems, I think, of our time right now is, uh, you know, uh, issues with income disparities, issues with housing. Mm -hmm. I mean, yeah, I, I don't know. I think if we, if we wanted to geek out on it, I think we, we should seriously talk about land use right. and, and really what, what, we're, what we're creating <laughs> right, by the right. rules that we make around land, because I think all roads sort of lead to that. So growing up in Pittsburgh, uh, your father doing insurance, your mother's teacher, um, brothers, sisters? And yeah, yeah, one brother and two sisters. And a sister is a social worker. A sister was actually in GE's training program, went around the country. Mm -hmm. you know, one was one of the first women in management in GE. And um, I had my brother, he got the sales gene and you know, he's <laughs> sort of working in more industrial. He's, he's a Rust Belt guy in some sense, is buying scrap and all mm -hmm. kinds of good stuff like that. Okay. Uh, what are some key lessons that you know, your father bestowed upon you? Well, unfortunately, my father passed away when I was six. And okay. so I've got a, a little window to work with. Um, certainly, he lived on through my older siblings uh, in many ways. Um, but, you know, I think uh, if I take risks, and I've taken some risks professionally over the years, mm -hmm. I think I got that from him. My mom okay. was a lot more sort of conservative and, okay. you know, a, a good custodian of the family, right? But, I, you know, he was the one, he bought a car he couldn't afford, and he bought a house he couldn't <laughs> afford, and eventually he could afford the car and the house. Right. But, you know, and I probably got some of those bad habits from But him. But he probably had premonition that it was going to come to life. <laughs> well, a certain really kind of confidence, right? Like, right. I, you know, I'll be able to afford this car. Right. right? So you you had older siblings. Yes, I'm the so baby of the family. I'm sure... Um, because this happened in my family, but my father passed away. Um, I think I had just turned 20 and my sister might have been 14. So I was able to give her some lessons, you know, of how dad might have thought. Uh, so what lessons did you get in that same sense? Yeah, well, I think with the loss of my dad, um, I think that put my older siblings in a, a different position of responsibility. My oldest sister, uh, uh, Deborah, lives in Pittsburgh still, uh, really sort of picked up the reins and, uh, you know, probably grew up faster than you know, maybe somebody, and she was in college at that time. Yeah, that's but, what usually happens. Too. Yeah, and, and I mean, uh, suddenly she was, you know, doing things that I, I think my father would have done, like taking me camping and, right. you know, those kinds of things. And so um, I guess I learned a lot about shared responsibility. Like right. I had a responsibility in that deal too. And you were right? spoiled too, because you were the youngest. Yeah, right. <laughs> Right, right, right. But I mean, I wouldn't trade my childhood for anything. I, no. I just, I, I think it sort of made me who I am today. Yeah. Um, sure. So when did you go to college? So I went to a little liberal arts school in northwestern Pennsylvania called Allegheny College. Okay. Tiny little liberal arts school, um, which was probably good. I mean, sort of looking back, um, you know, it was one of those places that it'd be difficult to get in a lot of trouble. Right. You know, it was in a little town. Right. <laughs> you know, the college was the big presence in the town. Um, and it really gave me an opportunity to, to get to know the professors, you know, in a, in a much more intimate way than a, in a bigger university setting, I think. Um, yeah. So, yeah, I was there, went off to then Miami of Ohio for grad school okay. uh, to study uh, with a guy who NASA called when John Glenn returned to Earth and fell in the shower. They called my mentor, uh, Don Parker, and they mm -hmm. said, why did this happen? And so wow. it, it was the reason I sought him out and his research program up there. So I, I was there for uh, four years and then I did my postdoc at MIT where they love, they love working with astronauts in the space program right, up there. Right, right. So talk about, um, you know, what were they looking for? I, of course, they were looking that he failed. Um, but what specifically were they looking for? Because I know they want to go a little bit more in depth in terms of what happened after he came back. Yeah, I think because uh, as a species, we've never really spent time weightless right. um, and only in small, like when you leap, you know, into the air right. <laughs> off a cliff or something, you have a little time of, it's essentially a state of free fall. Right. And it's a little bit hard for people to understand because you're floating, but it's actually the state of free fall. And when you're doing it around the earth, you're just falling around the earth the whole right. time. And so um, all sorts of new things were being sort of reported. So um, inversion illusions, you know, they don't know what up from down. Mm -hmm. And obviously they're getting sick because, you know, like, like seasickness or car sickness, right. different senses are telling you different things. And, you know, a lot of times your brain says you probably ate something poisonous. You better get it out of your stomach. Right. And so um, trying to make sense of 
what what we could do to prepare people to be in weightlessness, what we could do about things that were now emerging as affecting everybody. So a lot of it for, for my work was in the perception of it, psychology. Um, but, you know, lots of folks were looking at, you know, bones and muscles, right? Atrophy of muscles, mm -hmm. decalcification of bones. I mean, all sorts of things. It's a lot like aging, believe it or not. So a lot of the hallmarks of aging you'll see were people who spend a lot of time in weightlessness. Um, really because we do depend on our daily fight with gravity and, uh, you know, kind of its, its constant presence. We are here uh, in the community. We partner with our community health workers uh, to run vaccination clinics throughout the city of Louisville, uh, specifically downtown in the West End. Uh, the importance of events like these is that uh, a lot of people have transportation issues, so we are able to come out into the community and get people the vaccinations that they need. So it's really important to have um, these type of events uh, in the community because, you know, as we know, uh, when COVID and flu season comes around, our underserved communities are hit the hardest. Uh, so if we can bring any vaccines or anything that they need, glucose testing, it's important to meet people where they're at. At Park Duval, we care about the community. We do events like this monthly because we are the community and we love to give back to the community. Be sure to visit our website for more of our upcoming community outreach events. For more information, visit us online at pdchc.org. So that brings me, you know, I, I'm always curious, right? So at one point in space or air, do we become weightless? Like, because I'm on a plane. <laughs> You know, I might be 35,000 feet in the air, 7,000 feet in the air. How far up do I need to go? Yeah, yeah, well, it's, <laughs> <laughs> right, so, so, so to escape the Earth's gravitational field, right? right? I mean, you, um, I don't have the statistic in front of me, but low Earth orbit is a, kind of the, that's the point that we often point to. But it's, um, again, I don't, I don't have the numbers okay. uh, right in front of me. But, so we had to be yeah, I mean, you got, we got to get away from, we got to escape yeah, Earth's escape gravity Earth. is what we need to do. Okay. Yep. All right. So how would you test somebody for weightlessness? You put them in a machine? Because they know you have to put them in some type of device. <laughs> you know, when it's a space program, then we got to spend a lot of money on that device. Right. I, oh, that, was, that was my graduate years. So we created a program called the Pre-Flight Adaptation Training Program, okay. the PAT program. And um, while well, you can't make somebody truly weightless for any long period of time, you can do things with neutral buoyancy. So you can put somebody in a pool okay. and get them to a place where the gravity is, is completely counterbalanced by your um, air in your body that right. wants you to float. So you can get to a place where it feels a lot like you know, weightlessness. I don't float, so I couldn't have been an astronaut. Well, yeah, so there you go. <laughs> and I'm sure that was the only thing that held you back from being an astronaut. <laughs> so, uh, so you've got the neutral buoyancy work. We built a series of trainers that um, I thought was pretty clever at the time. And the idea was, what, we're, what our inner ear, we have a, a whole bunch of complica complicated stuff inside our ear that we don't hear with, but we get our balance from like gyroscopes in our head. Um, it turns out they're really good still at detecting you know, linear movements. Okay, so that they're doing their job there. But on earth, when I move linearly, if I filled my hand with pennies and I slid it like that, it would, the pennies would want to stay back, right? And if I tilt my hand, the pennies also move just like they would that way. So there's this ambiguity that was now present that it was useful in one sense, but it was missing something in another sense. So yeah. tilt and translation became this focus of the work. And so we created simulators that anytime I tilted you, I visually presented you with a linear translation. Okay. So I sort of reprogrammed right. everything that was coming out of your inner ear. And that was somewhat effective. I mean, it wasn't effective for everybody, but it was trying to take advantage of what we knew about how the sensors in our heads were working right. and how would you build a simulator to mimic some aspect of that. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's sort of, um, it's looking at how your ear affects your balance. Totally. Uh, which, which totally makes sense. And as we get older, I mean, it's a big problem. So it's right. seniors that fall, a lot of times they're falling because they tilt their head up to look at something and really their brain is not calibrated, mm -hmm. you know, at that point in time to deal with the unusual experience of that. So what did the experiment find? What was the findings? 
Well, so the goal of that work was really to reduce the amount of time that astronauts were disoriented and sick okay. operationally, right? You can imagine every hour costs a lot of money right. and there's expectations that we had in the space program, what they're supposed to be doing with their time. And so having this inconvenient uh, sickness uh, was, uh, was something that was undesirable. So, right. uh, you know, outcomes from that program for some crew members, they saw some reductions in the, the amount of time that they were sick. Um, Difficult to work in the space program because there are so few people involved. I mean, we've only sent uh, you know a couple hundred people to space right. since the beginning of sending people to space. You compare that to some of your expertise, where you might be looking at hundreds of thousands of lives, right, right to, to try to discern something. So that yeah, was a big very challenge. Very small sample size. Very small sample. Hard to tell what works and what doesn't work when you have such little power. So, uh, how long were they sick in space? Well, so, th so three days of um, of really not feeling good. Okay. Many uh, many crew members were medicating, so they would take um, uh, what's called scope dex, scopalamine, and dexamorphine, um, and they and that sort of dulls the nerves. Um, and the problem with the people that then medicate is they would then just not feel well okay. for a long as long as they were medicating, they right. would just kind of just not feel themselves. Right. So did they increase the dosage uh, from being seasick, you're on the ship versus being on the plane? Yeah, I mean, yeah. They, and they got to, the crew members really had a, a, an ability to medicate themselves. Okay. So really to titrate to how they were feeling. Okay. But yeah, I mean, it was a, it was a crazy way to start a career, I'll, I'll say that. It was. And so I'm assuming that y'all was able to solve the problem. <laughs> Uh, Which is why you, I was just Glenn not a safe sick. assumption. No, I mean this. Is welcome to science, right? Like okay. we're we're never ending journeys, right? Trying to figure stuff out. I'm just curious, how much that experiment costs? You know, I don't think I ever saw the all the, the invoices, numbers. but I mean, you know, probably a couple million dollars. I know, just. And this was part of a large program of really trying to figure this out. There was some crossover into the private sector, um, people in high performance aircraft, you know, fighter pilots, those kinds mm -hmm. of people. There's. There was some transfer of, of learning into those places, but um, and now with virtual reality being a very common thing, right. we see uh, sort of a resurgence in interest in things like simulator sickness and VR sickness. They're all related to the same constellation okay. of things. So you move on from Miami of Ohio and you go to MIT. So I, yep. I was in Brookline, Massachusetts at the Health Commission, so I'm, I understand the, the plight. Um, <laughs> And I worked a little bit with Harvard because we were trying to research um, marijuana and its uses on chronic diseases. Huh. So I'm sort of curious, you know, MIT. Yeah. Well, and I will tell you, of all the ways to show up at MIT, showing up uh, as, a, as a postdoc, right, you're all done with all your education. You've taken all the classes that anybody right. told you you needed to take. Um, that's a great uh, that's a great time to show up there because you know, the reputation is heavily weighted by the undergraduate experience. It's a very competitive university. Very I mean, much so. It, <laughs> I, you know, I, I, don't, I never would have been able to survive as an undergraduate there for sure. As a graduate student, you know, they're, um, they're really drawn from all around the world. So I, you know, I got to know people from all over the world, um, constantly a constant inflow of people just from everywhere who wanted to be in places like MIT to do their research. And so that was a really wonderful experience to just sort of give you a sense of science is a big community. It's a global community. Um, you really get an appreciation for just all the kinds of interesting things that everybody can bring. Uh, so yeah, as a postdoc, it was, uh, it, it's lean living. It's not a job. Right. <laughs> it's a, uh, it's a, it's a finishing experience. Mm -hmm. I think is a, is a way to think about it. And so I knew that I couldn't be there for all that long. I believe I was there for two years. Mm -hmm. uh, before it, it's a very on. expensive endeavor. <laughs> <laughs> well, and, and as you know, from Boston, I mean, just not, not the cheapest place in America no. to live. Uh, I really think hard. Boston, University of Boston tuition was 60,000. Uh, cause I was up there for five years. Dexter Southfield High School tuition was sixty thousand <laughs> in Brooklyn. Yeah, I so, don't know how anybody does any of that. Uh, so yeah, it was very expensive. Um, so what did you study when you were at MIT? So 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 the uh, my postdoc was in um, essentially aerospace medicine. Okay. So we were um, we were looking at a lot of the same things I was doing in graduate school, um, trying to understand the role of the inner ear and cognition. You know how we think about and how we perceive things. 
So um, we had a whole bunch of experiments that were focused on these new virtual environments. So, so virtual reality, it's hard because I have a, a college age kid now who's, you know, he does VR stuff. And I'm like, I don't think you understand. Like we were doing that in 1991, right. no, he, he just, <laughs> you know, and it looked, it looked terrible. <laughs> right. you know, and I know. And of course he says, well, that's not virtual reality. I'm like, no, really, it's, it's really when it all started a long time yeah. ago. Um, and so we were really trying to work with these head-mounted displays to um, see how we could use them experimentally, you know, mm -hmm. to, to create whole visual environments. Um, and that was something we just couldn't do before. Like right. I couldn't just plop you on a beach somewhere right. or in a field somewhere, right? Now we can do that. Right. Um, it's pretty straightforward. Hello, my name is Sierra Clark and I'm the Chronic Disease Manager at Park Duval Community Health Center. Ever since I started at Park Duval over nine years ago, I have been committed to helping patients live healthier lifestyles. I am currently serving patients in the Chronic Care Management Program or CCM program. My team and I help patients manage their chronic conditions such as obesity, high blood pressure, high cholesterol, and diabetes. In this CCM program, you will receive several benefits to help you manage your health. We offer monthly telephone calls to check in with your progress and to assist you with any concerns, assistance with scheduling your healthcare appointments, and assistance with filling your prescriptions in a timely and convenient manner. We also offer many resources to help you with the barriers you may face with eating healthy, being physically active, or monitoring your conditions at home. For more information, visit us online at pdchc.org or visit one of our health centers. Hello, I'm Dr. Swanee Jett. Please make sure you visit one of our five locations, not only in Louisville, but outside of Louisville and surrounding areas. Thank you. And, and I'm always curious uh, because I'm raising kids and uh, you know, you have a pretty influential job, um, but your kids don't care about that when you get home. And then as they grow up, they're like, whoa, I got to feel that position or that role or be that role model. Right. So how does your kid perceive you now? Now that he's in college and knows yeah, about yeah. what you do. Yeah, I mean, do. I think uh, I've, I've got two, two, two boys. Um, one's in graduate school, one's in his undergraduate. And I, I think the one that's in graduate school, I mean, he's taking the easier route. He's kind of following in, in similar footsteps, right? So we talk about things, uh, you know, well, well, he does something completely different than I did. It, right. You know, we have similar kinds of experiences. I think with the younger one in college who, as you just said, you know, has to think about what he wants to do, you know, what's he going to do in the world. Um, I think I think it's hard uh, I, don't, I don't know what, you know, your conversations are like, but, you know, so I am, I guess, at this point, a professional scientist, right? So I don't, I think I don't have a job that a lot of other people have, and I don't know that he can, he feels like he can turn to me to say, if I don't want to be a professional scientist, what can I do? And I've done a lot of things in my life, um, you know, that are not professional science. And, uh, but of course, what he sees is what he sees right in front of him. Right. So I think it's, I think it's a little harder, you know, for somebody who's, you know, not pursuing the you're okay. kind of following your dad's and, footsteps. And what is your other son pursuing that's similar to your Yeah, career? so, so he's, uh, he's in a PhD program at Duke um, uh, focused on uh, uh, theoretical chemistry. And oh, wow. it's interesting because um, if you hear that as a parent, you, you, the word theoretical. <laughs> right. <laughs> I, mean, it, I mean, so your first instinct is like, of all the things that you could pick <laughs> right. to go get an answer, why get something that just advertises, I'm not going to be of any practical right. use right. anytime I'm soon. I'm not going to use it. It's in theory. Exactly. I just, yeah. And so, you know, we just, you, you, and as a parent, you know, you, you always, I think, want what your, your kids to be happy. You want right. what's fulfilling for them. So I'm in no position to say, well, you shouldn't be studying theoretical chemistry, but you know, as a parent, you know, who doesn't want kids living in their house forever kind right. of thing. Uh, you know, I, I do want them to be thinking about that. And right. so, and he thought about it. He's like, look, I can work in a federal lab. I can work in academia. I can, right. So he's, I think he's put the thought into it. Um, but I mean, we are speaking different languages. Right. I mean, right. Cause know, I, I always, when I was in school, and you know, these professors, they teach theory. So by the time I get my doctorate, you know, I've been working in the field 10 years. And I said, when I'm a professor, I'm gonna be the bridge from theory to application. Because <laughs> which, <laughs> right? Which you are. Right, <laughs> so yeah. I, I, sometimes I don't understand. Uh, so yeah, that would frighten me. <laughs> uh, your other son does have it hard because I do remember, um, 
you know, one kid wanted to follow my footsteps. She wanted to do public health to be an epidemiologist. One kid wanted to run track, so I was fine with that. She said, I want to be a psychologist. But I had one kid that didn't know. And the ambiguity with not knowing was frightening for him, hmm. right? Because he couldn't decide. And I said, look, and you probably had this similar conversation. Um, I said, your dad tried every sport besides water polo. <laughs> um, I said, I, I was from artist to agriculture engineer to environment engineer to now public health. So I've chosen a lot of different routes to hone skills and then figured out, okay, this is the field. So maybe explore college. Right. All right. I mean, sounds bad because it's on somebody's down. <laughs> <laughs> Right. And that's <laughs> the be problem. Some controlled exploring. Right. Yeah, exactly. Controlled. Not unlimited exploring. But you have four years, uh, the way I look at it. Either you, you work in the workforce for four years, or you join the military for four years, or you go to college for four years. But I would guarantee you, somewhere in between there, you will figure out the route you want to take. I think you're right about that. And, you know, looking back, um, all the jobs that we have today didn't exist, right. <laughs> you know, when I was, you know, was leaving college. There was not even an environmental engineering program when I left Tennessee State to go to UT. So, so I think it's, it's, I think that's just really yeah. wise. At the end of the day, you know, you, you find, you know, make yourself useful, right? right? T take an interest, have some initiative. But I think the specifics of right. what you do, I think they're going to change all the time. Yeah, and then it changes too, because a lot of people they go to college and they get out and they do something different. So. What was your first job getting out of college? Because <laughs> you had a very defined path. Yeah, no, absolutely. So um, believe it or not, I, I, I got picked off from my, my postdoc into the private sector. And oh, so wow. um, uh, it's a company now called Accenture, but at that time it was called Anderson Consulting. Yeah, I'm and an Anderson Consulting. Yeah, yeah. Yes. So it was Arthur Anderson and Anderson Consulting, yeah. Arthur Anderson, tax auditors, Anderson Consulting, systems integrators. Mm -hmm. um, and they wanted to set up a virtual reality lab to train all their consultants. And they wanted to train them how to do object-oriented programming. And they wanted to do this spatial thing. And it was perfect. So they recruited me to Chicago. Um, they, get, they had me set up a lab, hired a bunch of people. Um, so that was actually my first job, and that's wow. not a usual first job. That is not a usual <laughs> right? A management first job, job is not your first job, and you know. Yeah, I mean, in just... Chicago. Uh, so where did you live at in Chicago? Oh, so we were out in the far um, western suburbs, St. Charles. So what okay. what happened is uh, they bought a small women's college and used it as their global training center, mm -hmm. and so they flew forty thousand people there every year. Wow. Uh, Motorola was also there. They were the largest corporate trainer, and, okay. and Anderson was the second largest corporate trainer. And so they were making a big commitment. All they had was their people, right. and so I understood it. Like I mean, it's not like they had factories, <laughs> right. assets. I mean, they just had their people, and so they they chose to invest in them. And so they wanted to do leading edge things with talent development and training, and Anderson. so it was a great place and to go. And they had the money too. It was yeah. huge. Yeah.